Welcome to Destination Michigan. We celebrate the people and places that make Michigan a great place to live. Sit back and enjoy tonight's edition of Destination Michigan. Support for Destination Michigan is provided by the CMU Bookstore. T-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, maroon and gold memories, and an official outfitter of Adidas apparel at the Central Michigan University owned and operated CMU Bookstore. Online shopping seven days a week at cmubookstore.com. The CMU Bookstore, online at cmubookstore.com, on campus in the University Center, and game day locations at Kelly Short Stadium and the CMU Events Center. And by Country Smokehouse in Elmont, offering a selection of gourmet meats, including homemade sausage and jerky. Also available, custom catering and weekend outdoor barbecues. Information at countrysmokehouse.com. Tonight on Destination Michigan. We protect these things that are important to us, including our buildings, our natural resources. I think there's a really strong pride in our community. We'll show off the amazing architecture of Harbor Springs. There's any number of things to keep kids occupied for hours and hours, and parents too. Explore the brand new Discovery Museum in Mount Pleasant. A lot of times the face is already there when you see it, and I just hold the knife and help it come out. Pat Harrison of Maple City is affectionately known as the Lord of the Gourd. This week on Destination Michigan, we're going to go to Ionia County to a place that produces one of my favorite things to have for breakfast. Hello and welcome to Destination Michigan. To kick off tonight's episode, we spring north to the quaint northern Michigan community of Harbor Springs. Harbor Springs reflects the beauty of northern Michigan in its shoreline, its bay views, and million dollar sunsets. And if you look closely, you'll find pieces of the town's history all around you standing tall. Tonight, Sarah Adams shows off the work of an architect whose legacy still stands as an ode to the past. Harper Springs, Michigan has a rich history that encompasses the stories of Native American families, lumbermen, Victorian era tourists, and year round residents, to name a few. And if you want to learn more about the history of this community, your first stop is here. The Harbor Springs Area Historical Society um, has been around for 22 years and we are in the business of, of preserving these wonderful parts of our community. Our archives is fairly small. It does include these uh, 15 to 20 sets of drawings, original drawings from Earl Mead. That name might not be familiar to you, but if you walk around Harbor Springs, the fingerprints of Earl Mead are everywhere. Downtown, we have the Harbor Springs Christian Association Library. We have several businesses downtown that were built by Mead, including the Irwin Building, which was built 100 years ago in 1913. There are a number of homes along Bluff Drive, private residences that were built by Earl Mead, designed by Earl Mead, and our high school uh, up on the Bluff was designed by Earl Mead. The Methodist Church, which is also down here on Main Street, designed by Earl Mead. So there are a number of his buildings still around that we use and look at every day. Earl Mead uh, was an architect and he was born in Lansing and studied at Michigan Agricultural College, which is now Michigan State, of course. And he began practice in 1893 in Lansing. One of his early projects in Harbor Springs was the Roaring Brook Inn, which was designed for this new resort association founded by Henry Pattengill, who was a Lansing businessman. At the time, 1890s, 1900, turn of the century, the transportation companies were really promoting Harbor Springs as a resort destination. The transportation companies were promoting Harbor Springs as a place for recreation, for health and well-being, fresh air, clean water, and because of this promotion and these new resorts forming, there was this 
there was a big draw here. People really wanted to come here and the businessmen who started the various resorts wanted people to come. They wanted people to be part of the, part of the resort communities. So Henry Pattengill very much wanted people to invest in his new little venture called Burring Brook. And so building the hotel there was a very important part because of course there were no, no cottages to start. And so what better way to get people to be interested in your resort than to have them come and stay. But there may have been another reason the young Mead signed up to do multiple projects in Harbor Springs and eventually moved to the area year round. His young family may have been the reason why he first came here or decided maybe to stay here. His daughter Jean, his eldest daughter, was born in 1893 and she had rheumatic fever. And some of the diaries from his brother-in-law indicate that the family came up north, his wife and two daughters, came up north to Harbor Springs and were spending a lot of time here while he was still working in Lansing in the 1890s. As a whole family, they weren't established here until 1899, but we think that daughter Jean's illness was perhaps the bigger draw. Either way, his career took off here, and today you can find many of Mead's original drawings in the archives here at the museum. And this collection is unique, to say the least. The original Earl Mead drawings that we have are 100 years old plus, and they have some of the most intricate detail. They're ink on linen drawings, and the detail in the stone and the marble is just amazing. And then he's added in a few drawings these little touches of whimsy. In one drawing, he has a man standing at a bureau of drawers getting ready for the night's event. He's tying his black tie and his suspenders are hanging down and he's getting ready for the evening. And that's probably not very typical for an architectural drawing from 1900. Particularly the cottage plans show built-in shelves and drawers and banquets and various parts of a home that you would usually think of as furnishing, but he did a lot of built-in. He had a lot of other details that were probably fairly prominent at the time, like the details in his windows, some porch details. They were fairly simple, but um, very much matched the, the resort architecture going on here. One of the most important aspects of his cottage design was the veranda, or the porch. The outdoor living spaces in the Harbor Springs summers were as important as the indoor living spaces. And so particularly his um, cottage designs featured one or two verandas for people to enjoy the, the breeze off the harbor, the breeze off the bay, um, very important part of his design. Mead moved to his family here in 1899 and he lived out the rest of his life here. Both of his daughters were married here. He participated in the community as well. He was a tenor in the church choir at the Presbyterian Church, and apparently his wife would play organ on occasion. We learned that he was also an insurance agent, so he was, you know, he was probably needing to do things beyond his, just his architecture, but he was very much involved in the community. Earl Mead's legacy lives on here at the Harbor Springs Area Historical Society and around the community of Harbor Springs. Our community very much cares about our traditions, our history. We protect these things that are important to us, including our buildings, our natural resources. I think there's a really strong pride in our community. History helps us understand the past so that we can make better decisions about the present and the future. And I think it gives us a really good understanding of, of who we are, where we came from, and where we're going. I think the reason this organization is so important is one part of what we're doing today and another part of what we're doing for the future because the organization exists to preserve our history. So it will always be a repository for archives, photographs, historic materials, and um, even though you have collectors within the community and people who have a strong interest in history, if you don't have a dedicated organization to preserve that, then, then you can't guarantee it for future generations. The Harbor Springs Area Historical Society has lots of information about Northern Michigan history. You can learn more at harborspringshistory.org. Next up, it's time to discover and explore through the eyes of our children. Saginaw, Traverse City, Grand Rapids, and Ludington each have their own children's museum. And Mount Pleasant recently joined in with one of its own. To the mountain town we go to learn more from Nate Lockwood about the 11 exhibits at the Mount Pleasant Discovery Museum. 
it's all about hands-on discovery and learning, and there's not one set objective that kids are supposed to learn when they come. Um, you know, one child may be playing with the water table and finding out that if they block off four of the valves that the water pressure increases on the fifth valve, where another person uh, may just reach in and say, ooh, it feels funny and wet. So there's all sorts of different experiences that people take away from the same exhibits, and that's what's great about the hands-on experience is that there's not a set defined learning outcome, they'll, all, they'll make their discoveries. What they'll find in here um, where they can you know, play and discover is we have a great beehive, a farmer's market, a magnetism area, a water table, an intercultural area, a Japanese culture. Uh, we have a toddler garden called Baby Carrots. We have a greenhouse area for gathering. We have a great uh, musical instrument room. Uh, we will have a rocket climber um, and we have this airways uh, exhibit where um, they can change the flow of air through valves and series of things. So there's all sorts of different things as well as art projects and all sorts of other uh, air-powered rocket launchers where they'll get to make their own rockets and figure out if I make a fin, it'll go straight. If I turn the fins this way, it'll curve. They can do all sorts of uh, physics discoveries with that activity as well. So there's any number of things to keep kids occupied for hours and hours and parents too. Uh, the great thing is is that we encourage parents to engage with their kids and play and it's almost as much fun, if not more fun, for the parents as it is for the kids to play. So it's a great time. All of the exhibits, they've got the research, you know, when they're doing things that they can make uh, them line up with the GLICs, the grade level outcomes, so that they, you know, if teachers need to justify field trips and things, that they have the ammunition to do that, that you know, it is educational even though there's lots of research that shows that kids learn so well through play that really that's really what we're in the business of is you know yes it's educational but we're in the business of play and what, how they discover through play and what they teach and we'll leave it to the educators to prove that the play is beneficial because we already know it is so yeah it's cool We say that we're kind of geared towards 1 to 12 is our primary target market, but that's not to say that kids who are older than that wouldn't still find it interesting, or some kids who are 11 or 12 may be at a point where they're, you know, it's not quite appropriate for them. So every kid is different, um, but typically about 1 to 12 is our kind of our target market. And then we also have a youth advisory board, which is made up of kids from ages 8 to 17. Um, we have about 20 kids involved in the program and they help plan fundraisers, they give input on exhibits and future plans, um, they help out when we have special events, uh, they're ambassadors for the museum and they're a great group of kids with a lot of great energy and great ideas. And we meet once a month and have some snacks and plan out the next month's activities and we have a great time. It's extremely rewarding to come to work um, and know that you're making a positive impact on the kids who are attending and on the community as a whole and to see the smiling faces and happy families. I think I have one of the best jobs in the world. It's funny when we get to 5.30 and closing time we expected to have to kind of go around and tell everybody it was time to go but what we found is that parents are, are thankful to have a time when they can say it's time to go that it's not their fault that they can blame us for closing time and say look it's 5.30 they're closing we got to go now because you know the parents are happy to bring them but uh, I don't think how many are expecting that they're going to be here for four and five hours um, you know when they come and the kids definitely want to stay that long because there's so much to do. Visit mpdiscoverymuseum.org for admission and membership information. Our next destination takes us north to Maple City, where Pat Harrison loves to walk through farmers' markets. He carefully handpicks his favorite squash and pumpkins, and he brings them home to his kitchen table to carve. To Maple City we go as Courtney Brooks introduces us to Pat Harrison, who is affectionately known as the Lord of the Gourd. I started out as the Pumpkin Bumpkin, but uh, I thought that was just a little too hokey after a while, so I changed it to the Lord of the Gourd, and that seems to fit. Pat Harrison is the Lord of the Gourd. What once was a hobby is now his full-time job. 
carving pumpkins, gourds, squash, watermelons, and cantaloupes all over the country and across the state of Michigan. It all started with one slip of the knife. I was trying to do a regular pumpkin and I slipped horribly with a knife and I cut a big chunk out of it. And it was the only pumpkin I had, so instead of throwing it away, I tried to save it. So I just started trimming out little pieces and trying to fix my mistake. And then I stood back and looked at it and realized it looked like the guy who worked at the 7-Eleven across the street. So I kept carving his face into it. And Next thing I knew, I was sculpting. Nowadays, Harrison teaches carving at schools and libraries during the day and visits restaurants in the evenings. On weekends, you'll likely find him at festivals and cider mills, carving for people of all ages. I sleep an average of about three hours a night during carving season. Um, just to give you an idea how crazy it is, I did 32 shows in October. A uh, typical day for me, I would get up maybe at 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, I always show up at a show with something pre-carved so there's something on the table. So I'll wake up in the morning, carve whatever I'm going to do for the show that day. And sometimes I'm right where I have to be, sometimes I have to travel. So typically I'll go do the show, which is anywhere from six to eight hours. And then I travel to the next town, get my motel room, and do the same thing again. The big thing with me is I look for shapes. To me, that's what makes the carving unique. In a two month period of time, I do about 400 pumpkins. So I don't have the imagination to come up with that many different designs. A lot of times the face is already there when you see it and I just hold the knife and help it come out. I like to say I don't find the pumpkins, the pumpkins find me. Harrison says that if you'd like to start carving too, most of the tools he uses, you probably have them at your home in a drawer already. I start with an X-Acto knife and then I use uh, pen knives and paring knives and just clay tools. Now there's a lot of kits out there that you see for carving and you know those work for people too. This is just what works for me. So the thing I stress is there's no right way, there's no wrong way. You just work with uh, what works for you. Don't try to carve like me, you can't. And I say that because it's coming out of my imagination. You may not be able to carve like me, but I can't carve like you. So if you're making it up, you're never doing it wrong. And that takes a ton of pressure off of everything. There are no rules to pumpkin carving. Yes, many of Pat Harrison's carvings are edible. For more information, search for The Lord of the Gourd on Facebook. Our final stop tonight has our Bob Garner taking us on an excellent adventure. Since 1958, the Herbrook Poultry Ranch in Saranac has been a leading egg production and processing company in our great state. And tonight we could finally have the answer to that age-old question, which came first, the chicken, the egg, or Bob Garner? To Saranac we go for some excitement as we wrap up tonight's edition of Destination Michigan. Tonight on Destination Michigan, we're going to try to answer the age-old question. What came first, the chicken or the egg? Chances are that if you cracked an egg or two into a frying pan this morning, it came from a Michigan family-owned egg farm near the little village of Saranac. The Herbrook Farm has been in the business of supplying the cackleberries or the hen fruit, as my dad used to call them, for Michigan family breakfast for well over 50 years. Actually, back in the 1920s came the idea that evolved into a multi-generational family business. I asked Greg Herbrook what it's like to have a family farm with millions, actually over six million hens, working for him. Yes, just over six million hens, that's the how many um, of the adults. But, you know, the great part about it is I love working with my family, and uh, that's what's made it, that's been the key to our success, is that we get along great, we enjoy working each other, with each other, we enjoy supporting each other, so that's, and, and then we've got, you know, we, we call them adopted family members, we've got 400 and close to 450 people working here with us, so it really, we try to foster that. I had great parents and great grandparents that, that, that really set the path for us. And you handle everything from start to finish? Yeah, the scope of our business, we start with, uh, we buy grand or, or parent stock, and we have a hatchery, and we produce hatching eggs that we hatch out to baby chicks, 
We bring them to our farm, our pullet farm it's called, where we go from day of age to about five months of age. And then they're mature, so then we move them to the laying farm where they spend the, the bulk of their life, about 14 months, in our care. And that's when they produce the eggs for us in our, in our egg production sites. Our hen houses are basically, the bulk of our birds are what are on inline complexes. In other words, the chickens are on the same site as the egg processing and distribution. So, we bring our chickens to our hen houses and supply them with feed, water and fresh air and, and care. And they produce an egg, which then, on a conveyor belt, comes directly to the processing plant. In the olden days, my grandpa and dad used to go pick them up at small farms and bring them back. Now, for freshness sake, in the very same day that it's laid, it gets processed and put in a carton. So the process is the, they initially come in the plant and they get washed. Then they get started inspection. The first inspection is, well, if, if, is it cracked and leaking? So if it is, we take it out of the stream and throw it away. If it has something wrong with the interior of the egg, like it might have a blood spot or a, a protein inclusion, we remove it as well. After that, it goes, it's, we dry it and start another set of inspections where we're looking at is it dirty and or is it cracked. Now an eggshell is kind of like a bell, so if you tap it, it, if it's not cracked, it'll ring true. If it's slightly it makes a cracked, tone, right? it makes a certain tone. So then as it gets, uh, the crack is greater, it's a different tone. So there's, t there's uh, sensors that pull that egg from the system and then allows uh, the rest of the eggs to continue on where they get weighed. And then they fall into a size class, which is your medium, your large, and your extra large and jumbos, which are basically weight classes. And then the machinery takes all the mediums and puts them in one packer and and then all the large in another, and then we place different, you know, various customer packages into the machine. The machine fills the packages, then we load them into boxes or onto carts or whatever the customer transportation system in. We cool them down. Uh, we have to cool them in 36 hours to uh, less than 40 degrees. And so all that is very much uh, important and controlled to make sure we get those eggs to maintain freshness and quality, get them cooled as quickly as possible. And then we turn around and get them to the customer as quick as possible. And we, so we have our own distribution trucks where it goes to retail or wholesale. We deliver many of our eggs ourselves. So when we package these eggs, um, we make a choice. We have several different customers. Some of them, um, for instance, a Meyer or, or, or such would have their own carton. And so we'll place those eggs in a Meyer carton. Others are specially fed and we keep those separate, for instance, Eglin's Best. And there's several different Eglin's Best labels that might be a Kroger or a Spartan or, or, or such that have their own brand within, that's, a, that's an Eglin's Best egg. So. Um, and then we have all the specialty eggs, we call them, which would be um, the cage-free or the organic. Most of those are also on an Eglin's Best program, so they have their, we're, they're fed those unique nutrients to get the taste and the flavors and the other um, benefits. Um, so most of these eggs then will, um, will distribute in where they're packaged either on a cart or into a box and wind up uh, and will deliver most of the retail business to the, to the stores themselves. Pretty much a rooster-free environment, huh? Yeah, uh, we keep a few around. They they show up and, and, and they, they they help the attitude in the hen house. <laughs> do they really? A few <laughs> roosters do? In, in the old days, it just it was just the just the sound in there, but um, they don't produce a lot of eggs for us. So. <laughs> <laughs> Herbrick's Poultry Ranch is the largest egg producer in Michigan and the thirteenth largest in the United States. To learn more, visit herbrooks.com. And that is a wrap for tonight. But join us again next time for another edition of Destination Michigan.